right, y'all can hear me okay? Yeah? Yes. Good. Okay, cool. Uh, so my name is Garrett Nowak. I'm the Senior Director of Network Architecture at 1111 Systems. Uh, I had the privilege of speaking at Autocon Zero. I talked about how my team went from uh, having zero network automation to taking our network infrastructure uh, to have the majority of it automated in under a year. So I wanted to cover some feedback I got from that. Uh, the over overwhelming majority of the feedback I got from that presentation was that everyone was starting at the same square one that I was at. So uh, the feedback I got was, you know, it, in case you missed that presentation, uh, it, it was awesome, by the way. Uh, <laughs> In case you missed it, uh, R square one was basically uh, everything was in spreadsheets or uh, we had text files with our config templates in it and we would just email each other, hey, do you have that? And we'd email it back and forth. Um, our change control was just sending an email to a, an email distro and if you saw it come in, good for you. And if you didn't, you missed it, that kind of thing. So people came up to me or reached out to me on LinkedIn said, hey, I'm exactly at that spot, but some of the roadblocks I have are that, you know, it's too hard. I can never learn how to do all that or, um, you know, like, what do I tackle first? I have no idea where to get started. You know, I, I had a, on my presentation, I had the whole architecture laid out and people said, like, I have no idea where to get started with any of this stuff. And then the biggest one was, um, you know, I can't automate my network because I'm not a programmer and things like that. So. I'm here to tell you that it doesn't matter where you start. The most important thing is to just start moving. So we're going to talk about how instead of being concerned about what the process looks like, just making progress and adjusting as you go along your journey. That's what uh, I want to focus on the first half here. So at AutoCon Zero, John Willis mentioned a book called Toyota Kata, and uh, I decided to check it out. So a little history. Uh, about myself. Um, I've always thought uh, that I had this knack for just getting things done. So I never really understood uh, where it came from, but it was kind of this thing of like, if I set my mind on something, then I would somehow make my way there. I wouldn't plan anything. I would just kind of wing it like a controlled chaos type of thing. And I would always end up reaching that goal. So a few years ago, uh, my dad died very suddenly. Uh, he was diagnosed with cancer, and then a month later he died. And I didn't live in the same city as him, and it took a huge toll on me. Uh, it was really hard. I really struggled through it. And so I ended up in a lot of therapy. And um, after I got past the initial grief and all that, I stayed in therapy, and I started to really dig into the, you know, what was that thing where I could set a goal and just happened to end up there. Um, I really started to understand it and trust it a lot more. And uh, it is something that uh, I didn't really know what, where that came from. And then at Autocon Zero, John mentioned this Toyota Kata book. And so I decided to write it down. And uh, you know, a few months later, I went back to my notes and I saw Toyota Kata written down there. And so I bought the book. I read it, and lo and behold, there's Toyota has been doing this idea of you know just getting things done for like 50 years now. Like they've been studying it, they've got this whole process written out, and the idea behind Toyota Kata is that you identify the end goal, and then you work out only the next step to reach that goal. So like a lot of companies write these massive project plans, and we've been victim of, victims of this too on my team. Uh, we write these massive project plans and then we fail to adapt when the steps don't go exactly as planned. So you end up making a, a slight mistake here or a slight deviation from your plan here and it just compounds itself so at the end you're way off course. And Toyota Kata says you need to just focus on the next step and then once you have accomplished that next step, see where you are and then define the next step. And so this idea applies to more than just work, right? So this is pretty much how I've lived my entire life without really knowing it. And uh, it's this idea of like, it's almost like winging it, but it's like a, a skill that you get where you can adapt to the situation. So we're going to talk about using that for your network automation journey here. So enough about me. 
how do you apply this to yourself and your automation journey? So Frodo and Sam, they didn't plot out every step of their journey, right? They probably would have written it down and said, what the hell is a Balrog, and then just gone back to the Shire for a pint, right? So instead, they just pointed themselves toward Mordor and they started walking. And so this entire philosophy around Toyota Kata is just not getting so caught up in the details that it affects your progress. So you just define your target condition, which is where you want to go, and then you figure out the next step in how to get there. And then once that step is done, you assess the current situation, which is now different than when you started, and figure out what the next step is. So with that in mind, when you start this network automation journey, I want you to ask yourself what your goal is for the journey. So like it was mentioned earlier, we have different goals for our network automation journey. It's like each of us are in different places right now. So for you to sit there and look at somebody preaching about how to do network automation, there's a good chance that it doesn't apply to what you're doing. So you need to define your goal where you want to go and then just think of what the next step is. You can't start planning how to get there if you don't know where there is. So set your goal, say what's the next thing that I need to do, and then do that. So worry about the next step after you finish the first one. Don't get bogged down on details. You just need to start moving. Now, if you still can't get there and you aren't sure where to start and you just need a push, I will gladly be the one to throw you out of the airplane and get you moving. So, this is mainly targeted at beginners, but I want the pros to take away something from this too. So if you're a beginner, I'm gonna give you a step-by-step -step guide to introducing network automation into your network. Uh, it'll build a foundation for you to build off of once you get this initial, these initial steps done. But if you're a pro, I want you to understand that these are the questions that beginners are asking about network automation. These are exactly the questions I got after AutoCon Zero. So if you're a pro and you want to know or learn how to share network automation so that more people adopt it, pay attention because this is exactly what beginners need to know in order to get started. So like I said, at the end of these steps, you'll be at a good stopping point where you can branch off to whichever direction you want with your automation. Uh, our square one network automation roadmap is gonna be uh, getting a device inventory, getting programmatic access to our devices, and pushing a config to it. Now, I understand that there's more to network automation than pushing configs to devices. We use it in our environment right now for things like troubleshooting, diagnostics. Um, we have sort of a self-healing edge network that we use with our ISPs that I talked about in AutoCon Zero. Uh, but this is a really good place for beginners to start because most of us already have a device inventory and we already have config templates that we're using. So this is just going to get it to where the majority of the stuff that you have right now is used, but in a programmatic way to get you started with your network automation journey. So for the device inventory, the goal here is to just get all of our network devices into a tool that is accessible programmatically. So like we used to hold device inventory and spreadsheets and sure that worked great for us for a certain amount of time. But as soon as we want to introduce automation, you can't query a spreadsheet, you know, like we need uh, API access or programmatic access to our device inventory. So my preferred choice is NetBox. Uh, you can deploy an internal NetBox server for free or you can pay for uh, SaaS instances like NetBox Labs. Um, I chose NetBox because it's free, uh, it's easy to use, it's got an API, which is the number one thing we're after here, uh, and it's well maintained. The community is huge. I don't think I've ever had a question about NetBox where I haven't just been able to Google it and find an answer for it, which is a huge deal. Um, please Google everything. Uh, so we're going to deploy NetBox on an Ubuntu server, or again, you can pay for a SaaS instance and then just create your devices in NetBox so that your device inventory is reflected in there. And again, you can do this manually, hand jamming it. I'm gonna bring that back from Autocon Zero. You can hand jam this into NetBox, or after you read the slides that I have coming up, you can programmatically put your devices into NetBox. So talking about our programmatic access to devices, um, once we have our list of devices, we're going to um, create an SSH session and programmatically log into our devices. So this workflow is gonna be an API request to NetBox to get our devices, 
and then we're going to use as we're going to use a uh, NetMiko to SSH to our devices. Now the slides coming up have QR codes on them. Um, when you scan the QR codes, it'll take you to a GitHub repo. And each of these slides is a script that just describes how to do what we're talking on, uh, what we're talking about on each slide. And then at the end, I'll put it all together for you so it goes from um, accessing your device list from Netbox all the way down to pushing configs to your devices. So for this one, this is uh, this shows how to perform an API request to Netbox. So we have a programmatically accessible device inventory now, so we can access that via a programming language. And I chose Python here because it comes with Ubuntu, which is what you deployed Netbox on, and it's really easy for beginners to get started with. So don't even argue with me about programming languages. That's not what this presentation is about. Um, Python has a library called Requests that allows you to make API requests from Python. So you'll use this library to query Netbox. It just takes the Netbox API URL, which is documented in Netbox because it's very well documented. Uh, you write a Git request, which is just querying Netbox for some data. In this case, we're querying our list of devices. And then you'll read it back from Netbox. That's it. It's just a few lines of code. And you are now programmatically getting a list of your network devices from Netbox. Now, this is probably the same. If you have a spreadsheet, this is probably the same as like using a filter on your spreadsheet column or whatever, but you'll see as we uh, keep building on this foundation how strong having your device list in an API or a programmatically accessible inventory tool is much better than using a spreadsheet. So for this one, uh, we're going to highlight NetMiko. Uh, NetMiko is a Python library written by Kirk Byers uh, you, for establishing SSH connections to your network devices. Uh, we're going to SSH to our device that we got from uh, Netbox and just run a show command. So this just teaches you what it's like to interact with your network devices uh, using a programming language. This is kind of where when I teach our uh, network engineers how to do this type of stuff, this is pretty much the step where everybody, uh, their face lights up. They're being able to uh, write out in Python and see results from your network device, that's where I see everybody like kind of experience the magic for the first time. All right, so on this step, this is the uh, configuration template side of things. So our goal here, again, we're trying to push configurations to our network devices. The last piece that we need here is our configuration templates. So um, this uses Jinja. Uh, it's also using an extremely basic example where I'm just creating interface descriptions, but uh, this can get as complicated as you want it to. We use Jinja for everything, almost everything in our environment, whether it's like configuration templates, whether we need to know what troubleshooting commands to send to our devices, if we need diagnostics on SFPs and things like that. None of those commands that you're running are static. So Jinja is not just something that you can use for configuration templates. It can be used for pretty much everything. And again, that's something that we use heavily in our environment to make sure that we can access everything, get the output we need, and make sure that it's as specific as possible. As you get comfortable with Jinja, like I said, it's going to get, it'll get more complicated and more useful as you get comfortable with Jinja. So this is the one where we put it all together. Um, this script here in the GitHub repo will query Netbox for a list of your devices. It'll use Jinja templates to create a configuration for each device, and then it'll push the configuration to each device using NetMiko. This is the first step to understanding what a typical automation workflow looks like. I would say the vast majority of our scripts, especially the ones that we use for auditing our environment, uses this workflow of get a device from Netbox, check the device configuration, and then push a change to the device. And this is something that we build when we teach network automation to our network engineers at my company and on my team. Uh, this is the foundation that we really hammer home for people. So whenever we get into we do training sessions um, less frequently than we used to, but we still do training sessions. Uh, when we do training sessions and we are starting a new project or we're starting a new example or things like that, 
I think the first question we'll ask everybody is what do we need to do? And everybody on that call says, oh, we need to get all our devices from NetMeco, or we need, or, I mean, NetBox. We need to get the relevant devices from NetBox. And so this is something as you practice and you, um, you start your automation journey, this is one of those things where you need to get very comfortable with this workflow of programmatically getting your devices, checking the device configuration, and then adjusting and pushing changes to those devices. Okay, so common pitfalls here. Um, the first one I wanna talk about is vendor choices. There are a ton of choices out there, and I think somebody mentioned it earlier. Um, you don't have to use NetBox. You need to use whatever fits your environment. Um, just pick the one that satisfies your current needs. Don't get worried about like, oh, I don't wanna pick this because maybe two years from now I'll have to change to a different vendor. The skills you're learning right now translate very well across vendors. So maybe not any of the vendor specific things like NetBox has specific terminology in it, but the way that you're accessing that data and the way you're using that data once you have it is gonna carry across vendors. So don't sweat it if you end up changing vendors down the road, don't get bogged down on vendors, find something that looks like it fits your needs and go for that. The next thing is that a lot of projects die at the budget conversation. I am very familiar with projects dying at the budget conversation. So the roadmap I showed you is probably as cheap as it comes. You could run this on existing virtual infrastructure, which is what we do on my team. You could buy a Raspberry Pi if you could get your hands on one. Uh, you know, it's an extremely low barrier uh, of entry with this roadmap here, because Python, NetBox, Request, NetMeco, all of that is free. The next thing here is coding knowledge. So yes, you are going to have to learn some program, some basic programming. The good news is that something I've found teaching our network engineers is that a lot of the skills that they have as network engineers translate very well over to programming. So, uh, you know, learning Cisco command line is pretty much equivalent to learning a new programming language. So when our network engineers are nervous or apprehensive about learning new programming language, I just tell them, you know, you've already done it once, so you, you know, you can do it again. Um, executive buy-in is a big one. Uh, we've already covered the budget aspect of it, and I promise you if you go to your execs and you tell them that it costs zero dollars for you to start learning network automation, that's a, a real good first step. But the, the hard truth to executive buy-in uh, for me, I did not get executive buy-in when I first started uh, network automation. So uh, r roughly 10 years ago or so. Um, I just didn't tell them that I was doing network automation. Uh, there's a theory in programming called it's easier to ask forgiveness than permission. And uh, I leaned on that extremely hard when I was learning uh, network automation. Um, the, the hard truth is that there isn't one tool out there that just works for everybody. Like you can't just, you can't just submit a report to your execs and say, hey, it's gonna cost us $100,000 to run this tool and like bada bing, bada boom, we've got network automation. I spent countless hours at night in bed programming, you know, two o'clock in the morning learning this stuff. There comes a point in time where you have to decide what, what your level of commitment is to it. So I understand there's not like a simple answer for executive buy-in. You might have the worst leadership in the world and you just hate them. And like, that's a reality for some of us, right? So my advice is if you have any time and you are serious about learning network automation, you just have to find that time. Like eat your lunch at your desk and if your boss asks what you're doing, tell them you're on your lunch break. Like figure out some way to come up with time to learn this stuff because you're not just going to roll over or roll out of bed one day and immediately know all this stuff. It takes a lot of practice. Uh, David, he's on my team. He and I have a combined 30 years of programming experience. So by no means do we just wake up one day and we suddenly knew how to, to automate our network. But the important thing to take away is that we did start. You know, if we had a lot of mistakes, we still make a lot of mistakes. We make mistakes, we've been talking right here in between uh, presentations about things that we are thinking about, mistakes that we have made, and he's, he sits there and updates his code. I'm going off on a tangent, but I promise you that you will make a ton of mistakes, but you have to make those mistakes, and don't let your leadership be the thing that stops you. 
So organization, again, this is a huge project, or at least it can be. Um, when this stuff clicks for you, I promise you, your mind is going to shoot off into a thousand different directions. It's, it's like uh, picking up candy off the floor. You know, you just can't stop, and you're going to start going in all kinds of these different thought processes and think, oh, I can do that project, I can do that one. Um, the, my advice to you on staying organized is to write incredibly detailed documentation about what you're doing, whether it's code documentation or you've got it in Confluence or whatever it is. I can write code on Friday and come back Monday and I'll look at it and say, I don't know what the hell I was doing here. So it's extremely important for you as this project grows. I mean, you, you might start now with config templates, but a year from now you might have, like I said, our, our um, WAN network, our connectivity, our ISPs is uh, in a sense self-healing. And so you can go from those simple things like config templates to these self-healing networks and if you don't write down what you're doing, it's going to become a mess. So somebody, you're going to invite somebody into your team, and they're going to have no idea what you wrote. Uh, I think you talked about that. Um, so it's incredibly important for you to write documentation, almost as important as actually writing the code itself. And then indecisiveness. To, to your indecisiveness, I say jump, damn it. Just do it. So my final motivation here, if you are where I was at square one, and I know a lot of you are because you have told me that you are at my same square one, you're in the perfect place, you are not behind the curve, it's not too late to learn. So you're at the start of your automation journey and you get to decide what it looks like. Just point yourself towards your goal and start walking. Questions? Nice talk. I think a lot of us tend to say we made mistakes, we made mistakes. I think if we can rephrase what we are doing as learning, we are learning, I think it will yeah. be much better because, you know, mistakes are just a way of telling us that we, can, we are learning and we, are doing, we know how to get better. Because I also think when we say mistake, many of us tend to beat ourselves a little more and that prevents some people from making progress. Whereas if we say we are learning, you're always moving forward. Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. Something that we talk to our, our network engineers about when we're teaching them. Um, I, had somebody, I had somebody last week, maybe the week before, uh, we were working on a project, whatever. And um, they said, is it always like this? Because I just, I just kept messing up. It was like, and I told them, you know, the programming network automation is just an exercise in trial and error. The entire thing is trial and error. If you're not messing up, you're not learning anything. So I 100% agree. I just want to piggyback on that. I, I, Urz, I forget how you put it, but you said something similar to that without beating yourself up. I'm going to go back and look at the video. So, yeah. Anybody else? Oh. Thank you uh, for the presentation. Um, one of the takeaways I've had in this session is there's a lot of learning to do for mm -hmm. network engineers. And um, I appreciate the fact that you mentioned that on your team you have traditional network engineers who are to learn coding and yeah. all of that. Now, my concern, which I have, and as well as other many uh, network engineers, is where do we draw the line from moving from a traditional network engineer to a system or software engineer? Uh, because many people have perhaps been a CLI, Cisco CLI, Juniper CLI person all their lives for 10, 20 years. And because they want to adopt network automation, now they might need to learn, learn Python, the libraries, and all that. So where do we, is there a place where we draw the line or you just advise people to keep going uh, from the traditional background that they have into software development or there is a place where they need to stop or you advise them to stop? Yeah, no, I, I think there's not a one size fits all answer uh, on our team. First and foremost, everyone's a network engineer on our team. So we use network automation as uh, something to assist us in our network jobs. Like we're not in any, nobody is shifting into software development on our team with a flavor of networking. Everybody is still definitely a network engineer for us. I think the, the hardest thing about that though is 
on our team, which I imagine is true for a lot of teams, we have varying degrees of knowledge when it comes to network automation. So, and some people just don't have, um, I, I don't know, some people don't have all that free time, and so their growth doesn't accelerate as fast as others do. So for us, we look at network automation more as a tool for us to use rather than, I, I don't know, like a job position to go into, I guess. Uh, does that answer your question? Yeah, I don't know where to draw the line. I think it, I think it varies, you know. But yeah, we stick to net. We stick to networking. That's our that's our core focus, and we just use software development to assist us. Yeah. Um, well, uh, my one has actually two topics. Uh, okay. The first one is uh, thank you very much for uh, talking about your personal life at the beginning especially about the therapy part. Mm -hmm. I think uh, network engineering is a very high pressure yeah. uh, job and a lot of us can struggle with mental health. So thank you for you know taking the courage and saying that it's okay to seek help. Um, but coming back to the subject, the second one is you mentioned that during this year, you worked from basically starting from the scratch in automation and then let's say automating a big part of your uh, daily tasks or the, the, the processes that you have on your network. Um, coming back like from this, uh, let's say, DevOps mentality, what are now, based on your feedbacks, the big thing that you want to improve on your automation stack, or what is the big project that you're looking forward after you already have a baseline of automation? What, what do you see that is the next big thing that you want to have it on your automation uh, uh, journey? Me personally, or my advice to um, let's say on your whole team, like uh, wh where where your team is looking forward in terms of improving the stack that you already have today. Okay, yeah, um, actually submitted this as a proposal for AutoCon too. So for my team specifically. Um, we used a lot of the things that we learned at AutoCon Zero, or more so ideas that we got out of AutoCon Zero to basically restructure the way that we do automation. Uh, we were using automation pretty much as a library of scripts at the time, and we really lacked uh, orchestration behind it. And at AutoCon Zero, orchestration was a huge topic, and it kind of shined a light on we, we were, we thought we were ahead of the curve, and I think we were ahead of the curve as far as what our scripts could do, but we were extremely behind the curve on the orchestration part of it. So something that we've worked on from, I think it was last November, was AutoCon Zero. So something we've worked on the last six or seven months or so is um, rewriting everything from an orchestration standpoint. And uh, it has been one of the coolest things that we've ever done. Our orchestration, the foundation that we built for it, has spanned to our uh, storage teams, our VMware compute teams, and things like that. Like the foundation we built has gone over to those teams as well. So we kind of had this um, revelation as far as orchestration goes. So that's a big thing that we're dealing with now is we don't just want to have network engineers pushing buttons to run these scripts. We want this orchestration tool to be aware of what's going on in our network and to provide feedback to us so that we know when things are out of compliance, or we need to address firmware issues, things like that. Hey, uh, loved both your talks. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Um, so as a leader in this space, uh, I want to know if you faced any challenges with active resistors or net, de net detractors. Not only, to use your metaphor, you've shoved them out of the plane, but they don't want to open their parachute, and they'll happily hit the ground. Um, but not only your own engineers, maybe, but also in the wider business, so any teams you interface with? Um, I don't think I'm gonna have, uh, well, okay. So I, our team is, our team values, um, I don't know the right way to put it. Um, we have, we want a very tight ship on our team. So if you do not, um, fit the chemistry with our team as far as our ideals go and the things that we're striving towards, um, then that's not a fit for our team. So uh, that's kind of like a brutal answer, I guess, as far as our team goes. But I, that's what makes our team so strong, is because everybody's rowing in the same direction on our team. 
We have anybody that's not rowing the same direction. I love talking to people and understanding their perspective on things because it helps me learn a lot about what we might not be doing right in our network automation stuff. So if somebody has another idea, I don't want to just shut them down and say, you know, that's that's not what our team does. Uh, I, I like to hear it. So. Um, as far as outside of our team goes, I really haven't had much resistance. You know, like I said, um, easier to ask forgiveness than permission was my style of going into it. And by the time that uh, I was asking forgiveness, I had a lot of it built out and it, there was really no going back from it. So uh, I don't really have a, a cool story or anything about like meeting that type of resistance, but it really is a strong aspect of our team that we make sure that everybody's on board with what we're doing, if that makes sense. One last critical question. Did you address the fluffy bunny? Oh, um, yeah, this is my son's. Um, he didn't want me to forget about him when I came to Amsterdam. He's four, so he told me to bring this to uh, remind me of him, so. Awesome, thank you, Garrett.